Hey everyone, Kevin P. McAuliffe here, and I am back again with another Creative Cow tutorial. And in our next lesson of our Learn Media Composer tutorial series, we're really going to get in now and we're going to focus on settings. And we're going to start right at the very top of the settings window and we're going to work our way down. And we're going to go into a lot of tangents because we're going to start talking about obviously bins we talked about in the last lesson. And what's going to happen is, is that as we get to these topics, we're going to sort of veer off. And if we happen to be talking about bin settings, we're going to get more in depth on bins. If we happen to be talking about sequences, we're going to get more in depth on sequences. And this is really going to take us a while to get through all of these settings. But it's important that you understand them and it's important that you see how they work and how you can make them work for you. Okay. Okay, not a long introduction. Let's just get into Symphony and let's get started. Okay, so let's Command Tab into Symphony. Now, one thing that I do want to mention before we move on is we're obviously talking about learning MIDI Composer. And obviously, as you saw by the thumbnail, we're talking about MIDI Composer 6. But what's important to keep in mind is that the great thing with MIDI Composer is, is that it has not changed a great deal really since I started using it back at version 5.5. Now, I'm not talking about 5.5 that just came out, you know, a year ago. I'm talking about the way it originally worked was, was that MIDI Composer, when I started using it at version 5.5, those versions went up to version 12. And then it switched over to MIDI Composer Adrenaline, and now we're up at version 6. So technically, I've been using MIDI Composer for about 13 versions. And really, if you look at the changes that it's gone through from version 5.5 from way back till now, there really isn't that much that's changed in the core fundamentals of how the application works. So even if you're using an older version of Media Composer, you're going to get a lot out of this tutorial series. Now, of course, I said that we're going to get in and we're going to start talking about settings. And you'll see that the very first setting up at the top is AMA. And believe it or not, we're actually going to skip over that one because I'm going to handle AMA in its own dedicated tutorial. And we're going to talk more about the AMA setting at that point. I think the first one that's very important to start with is audio. And I'm going to show you why it's very important to start with audio because this is a common problem that even I run into all the time when I've had to reinstall MIDI Composer or something like that. What we're going to do is we're just going to come back to our bins and of course I'm going to open the audio project. Because what I want to do is I want to create some tone media, everyone's favorite sound tone. What we're going to do is I'm going to come and I'm going to open up the audio tool. A couple ways that I can open the audio tool. The audio tool can actually be found right up here under tools. You'll see it's right here, audio tool, or the shortcut that I encourage you to use all the time, command and one on the Mac, control and one for all of my Windows friends out there. I'm going to hit command and one. And obviously the audio tool is just that. This is a way that you can see the waveforms of the audio inside of your timeline. But it also has a couple other functions as well that you can use it for. And in this case, I want to use it to create some tone for me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to navigate to the PH or the peak hold menu. I'm going to drop that down. And you're going to see right down here at the bottom, I have the ability to create tone media. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to select that. And you're going to see now that I'm brought to the create tone media window. I can choose the DB that I want to have the tone at, in this case, minus 20. I can have the tone media frequency and hertz set to whatever I want. Now, the tone media length, I think I'm going to leave that at 60 seconds. The number of tracks I want is two. What bin do I want this to go to? Now, I'm only going to have one option because I only have one bin open. And what drive do I want to have this on? I'll just leave it on the Jazzy drive. Now, what's important to note about this is right here, minus 20. So I'm assuming that I'm going to see this tone right here at minus 20 when I play it back after I drop it into my timeline. So I'm going to say OK. And what's going to happen over here in my audio bin, as you just saw, is the tone media has now appeared. What I'm going to do is actually close the audio tool. And you're going to see why in just a second. What I'm going to do to edit this clip into a new sequence is simply double click on the clip. You'll see as soon as I do, it appears up here in the preview window. And if I come along and I just hit play, you're going to see, and you can probably hear it coming through my headphones, pretty loud and pretty annoying, is that tone media. But here's what's going on with that tone media. What I'm going to do is I'm going to hit T on the keyboard to mark this entire clip. We're going to get more into the keyboard settings in a later tutorial. What I'm going to do is hit T on the keyboard on both Mac and Windows. And what we're going to do is edit this into my timeline in one of two ways. I can press B, B as in Bob on both Mac and Windows, or what I can do is simply navigate over here and do this as an overwrite edit. The reason I always encourage you to use the keyboard shortcut again much faster. You'll see now that once I hit B on the keyboard to edit that into a timeline, what's happened over here inside my audio bin is I now have a new sequence called appropriately enough, Untitled Sequence, 
you'll also see that it's called Untitled Sequence up here in my record window. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give this sequence a name. Why not? We'll just call it Tone Sequence because that's what it is. But here's what I wanted to show you. You'll see that we also have an audio tool located right here in my timeline. It's a little bit difficult to see. So that's why I like using the audio tool. And what I'm going to do is just stretch the audio tool down here just like that. And what's going to happen is I'm going to come back to the beginning and hit the space bar. And I want you to watch the tone should be at zero and it's not. You'll see it's actually some dB too hot. Now, I know you're probably thinking to yourself, well, what does this have to do with anything besides the fact that it looks like there's something wrong with Media Composer, or in this case, Symphony? Well, believe it or not, there's nothing wrong with Symphony. There's actually something set incorrectly for my workflow. And what I'm going to do is, believe it or not, this is actually linked to that very first setting we we're going to talk about, the audio setting. What I'm going to do is double click on audio setting, and you'll see inside the audio settings window, the most important setting that we want to set is right here, the default pan. Right now it's set to center everything. So basically what it's done is it's monoed this tone. That's why it's 3 dB too hot. What I'm going to do is switch this to alternating left and right. I'm going to close the audio settings. I'm just going to call up my audio tool again. I'm simply going to hit play on the keyboard and you'll see now that my tone is playing back correctly. It's imperative that you get in once you create a new project and switch that default pan setting right from within the audio settings to be alternating left and right. If you don't, all of your audio is going to be slightly out of whack and you're going to wonder why. Well, that's why, because everything has been monoed. Now, before we move on and talk about the audio project settings, there's something that I want to point out that's a little bit hidden that if you're not looking closely enough, you're definitely going to miss. And that is you're going to notice over here at the bottom of my project window, I can actually drag over and take a look at some more settings. And you're going to see that I have this list that says user, user, project, user, 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 site, user, user. And it looks really confusing. And, and you know, in most cases, people would look at this and they'd be like, oh, I don't even know what that means. It's not important. Well, here's why this is important. You'll see that if I come back, let's just use the first two as an example. Actually, we'll use the first three. Right now, AMA, audio, and audio project, they're set to be user, user, and project. What this means is that, for example, the third one here, the audio project, this is what's considered to be a project setting. So if I switch projects, this setting here is always going to stay the same based on whatever the project is set at. Any user settings that are set, you'll see AMA and audio, are going to move with me, my user, Kevin P. McAuliffe, to whatever project I happen to go into. So that's something that's very important to keep in mind. You're going to notice obviously that we have one as well, which is a site setting, which obviously would override everything else. You'll see site is for the communications or the serial port. That's universal across the entire Media Composer or Symphony application. So I wanted to point that out. That's something important to keep in mind. You might be wondering, well, why when I came into this project did that setting reset itself? Well, that's why. It could very well be a project setting. So you're going to need to remember where in cases like audio project, you're going to need to get in and switch that on a project by project basis. Whereas things like audio, once you switch it once for your user, it's always going to stay like that no matter what you do. Okay, so let's go in and take a look at our audio project settings. Again, we're not going to go in and look at every setting because we'll be here forever. We're just going to take a look at the important ones. And inside the main window, we've got a couple of important ones. First of all, sample rate. In most cases, if you're working on broadcast television, 48 kilohertz is where you're going to want to be at. In this case, we have some choices for the audio file format. It's set to PCM or MXF right now. I could switch that to WAV or I could switch that to AIFFC. In most cases, you're going to stay with current technology of PCM or MXF. You can choose the bit depth, 16-bit or 24-bit. And you'll see that if I jump down here, we can convert sample rates when playing if we wanted to, always or never. In most cases, why wouldn't you want Media Composer or Symphony to convert it as you're going? You can show the mismatched sample rates as different colors in your timeline if you want to. And you can even remove extra filler after punch-ins. We're going to talk more about punch-ins in later tutorials. You're going to notice the next tab we have up at the top is the input settings. Right now, the only input choice we have right now, because I'm working on an iMac, is the host 1394 or the FireWire input. You'll see if I try to drop it down, I do have a couple of other options here, which is the built-in microphone, obviously built into the iMac, the built-in input or the line input of the iMac, and I could even, if I wanted to, use the M Audio Fast Track Pro USB. Now, you're probably thinking to yourself, what's that? Well, that's the unit that's letting me talk to you right now. 
through my microphone and I'm able to listen to myself with my headphones. But because we're obviously talking about an input for some sort of video we'd be editing with, or in this case audio, we're always going to leave that as host 1394. Now depending on the type of capture card you might have on your computer, obviously your input choices are going to change slightly. Okay, so let's move on over to the output tab. Now inside the output tab, you're going to see that we can actually get in and adjust the output gain right here if we wanted to, the overall output gain. But here's a big one that you're going to want to remember. Right now, you'll see that the output is set to stereo output. And in this case, I'm mixing to channels one and two. But you'll see, depending on how I want to output the tape, I can even mix to three and four if I wanted to. What you can also do is click on stereo and you'll see that I also have the choice to output to mono and I have a bunch of options here for 5.1 and 7.1 that are grayed out. Obviously because of the setup of my computer, I can really only output stereo and mono. But if I had, you know, a proper capture card, you know, like the Nitrous box, the Mojo box, even getting into boxes like the Kona 3 and things like that, where I would have SD or HDSDI outputs, then you can get into having multiple audio channel outputs and you can get in and select the type of output you want. In this case, I could select mono and I could still mix to one and two or mix to three and four. But I think I'm gonna live in the world of stereo here and I'm happy with that. So let's go into the hardware tab. You'll see in the hardware tab, the card that I'm using is the Core Audio Host Audio or the 1394 Audio, which is the built-in card on my computer. The peripheral, of course, is what I'm talking into right now, the M Audio Fast Track Pro. And last but not least, inside of here, I can choose the sync mode of internal reference because I obviously don't have any blackbirds coming to this computer to set as reference. You'll see that I can also get in and override audio sync if I wanted to, but I don't think I'm going to do that. Last but certainly not least, we have the effects tab where I can get in and I can bypass clip gains, I can bypass volume, or I can bypass EQ. I can also get in and adjust the sample rate conversion render quality to be high and slow balanced or low and fast, you're going to notice in most cases, a lot of these settings are set the way that you're going to want to use them. You're not really going to need to get in and change them. You'll see right now that Symphony is set to have real-time audio dissolves. They're enabled. I could disable that, but why would I want to do that? And last but certainly not least, I can adjust the dissolve midpoint attenuation to be linear at minus 6 dB or a constant power of minus 3 dB. I'm just going to leave that as linear 6 dB. In most cases, like I said, you're really not going to need to adjust anything inside of your audio project settings unless you really want to get in and specifically tailor things to how you want to work, like changing the sample rate. Okay, so I'm just going to close the audio project settings because believe it or not, we're ready to get more into bins, but I'm going to leave that for the next tutorial because bins is a big one. You'll remember in the last tutorial we got in and talked about the bin settings, but now we're going to get in and we're going to take a look at bins in general because we're going to talk about things like bin views, we're going to talk about layout, we're going to talk about organization. There's a massive, massive, massive amount of stuff that we're going to want to talk about when it comes to bins to really get you organized. So if you have any questions, you have any comments, or you have any tutorial requests, you can send them to Kevin P. McAuliffe at gmail.com. This has been Kevin P. McAuliffe. Thanks a lot for watching.